Scott Wright, the president of DraftCountdown.com. Always kind enough to join us here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline as he wraps it all up for us here. The 2018, the most watched, most viewed, uh, and uh, very entertaining this year. Scott, welcome back, pal. How are you? Hey, thanks. Uh, I'm doing excellent. And it boggles my mind, too, how the draft just keeps getting more and more popular every year. I mean, back when I first became a fan, back in the mid-'90s, it was such a niche thing. I have to imagine this is what like comic book fans feel like, seeing all these comic book movies. It's just it's unbelievable, the growth. It really is. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see where it lands next year. Uh, Philly last year, Dallas this year. We'll see where they have it in 2019. But let's take a look back at some of the moves here. Start with Philly. They did not have a first-round pick when we last talked. We were getting ready. They end up making a very sneaky move. Jason Witten retires. A lot of people thought tight end for Dallas. Philadelphia jumps in front of them, and they take Dallas Goddard. Tell us a little bit about the move Philly made and the player they ended up with. Yeah, they got my top-rated tight end. And it was close between the top two or three, but I prefer Goddard. Uh, the number, he was my number one small school prospect in this draft, and I think he had a legitimate chance to go late in the first round. The Ravens went with Hayden Hurst from South Carolina, but I think they were in the market there. Uh, you look at the New Orleans Saints, I think they had some interest in, in Goddard, but then they traded up. So uh, a good value uh, and, and a really good player. And the thing that struck me about Dallas Goddard, seeing him down at the Senior Bowl, is you see these numbers and you put up these crazy numbers as a pass catcher at a, at a lower level of competition. But So in your mind's eye, you have this idea of him as kind of a, a bulked-up wide receiver, maybe a one-dimensional player, but not the case at all he has a huge frame I couldn't get over how just large he is and just long arms and he has more than enough tools to get the job done as a blocker in addition to a pass catcher so I think a really good pick and and like you said don't discount uh, them maybe getting a moving up ahead of their division rival to get a player that that could have helped Dallas and hurt Philly this year yeah and uh, Philly lost Trey Burton and Brent Selick so they really had Ertz and nothing else uh but would you agree that he is more of a pass-catching tight end than the Brent Selleck blocking type of tight end? Absolutely. And and if you go watch the highlight reel, he's got some just incredible one-handed catches. So uh, he is absolutely a terrific pass catcher, but uh, has the ability to be a really good all-around tight end too. Uh, Scott Wright, DraftCountdown.com. You know, the Eagles didn't have a lot of picks yesterday. Uh, Howie Roseman mentioned that our third-round pick was Ronald Darby. Our fourth-round pick was Jay Ajayi. Our fifth-round pick was Michael Bennett. But they did take a couple guys in the fourth. Avante Maddox from Pitt, a guy with a lot of speed but smaller. And some people have suggested if he was a little bigger with his skill set, he might have been a higher pick. Uh, what do you think about Avante Maddox? Yeah, and Avante Maddox really made himself a lot of money at the East-West Shrine game. Just a standout showing there, and you mentioned the size. He's only 5'9", 184 pounds, but very fast. If you're going to be small, you better be fast, and he very much is. He ran a 4.39 at the Combine, so uh, that was right about where he was expected to come off the board. And there was even talk maybe he could have snuck into the back end of day two. So good value, and a guy who's going to come in and help them right away. And, and you know, that's where Philly is as an organization. They're not necessarily thinking – Five years down the line, uh, they, I think they want some guys who can come in and, and help take advantage of this window while it's open and maybe try to win another Super Bowl. And I think Maddox is going to come in and, and play a role immediately, even if he doesn't have the type of upside of maybe a number one corner. He's not going to be Deion Sanders or anything like that. But he might end up being a nickel, but there's nothing wrong with that. A nickel is basically a starting player in the NFL. Yeah, so. I was going to follow up with that. I mean, do you see him sliding to the inside? We had talked to the Pitt radio analyst, uh, Billy Osborne, about him earlier. He said one thing that he does really well, that he was kind of forced into doing well, is get his nose up in there and tackle. You see a five foot nine guy coming in there and making tackles, but he said at Pitt that was kind of the scheme, and they were forced to do that. So translate to the NFL, do you see him as an outside corner or more uh, sliding? Because Howie Roseman did say they were going to look at him inside, but he was going to get a chance to really show what he can do. Um, but you would assume they lost Patrick Robinson. They needed to fill that spot. Yeah, he, and he's definitely feisty for a smaller guy. And I think the other thing to keep in mind, too, with Avante Maddox is he gives them a different skill set 
than what they currently had. I mean, you look at who was currently on the roster, uh, uh, Jalen Mills, Russell Douglas, uh, Sidney Jones. I mean, these are all tall corners. They, I bet every one of those guys is at least 6'2". So, you know, he's a smaller, quicker guy, and, and I think he's going to help them in, in particular matchups where those taller guys might struggle a little bit. So um, I, I think it was a, a, a good pick uh, for, for what they needed specifically. Scott, Josh Sweat is an interesting guy. I heard a lot of people say that he might have been a higher pick if not for his injury. What can you tell us about him? I mean, he looks like a first-round pick on paper, physically. I mean, he's that type of uh, physical talent. Uh, and and I, I actually had him as my sixth-ranked defensive end. I mean, he's just a shade under 6'5", 250 pounds. He ran a 4.53. It's all about durability. Uh, he was a big-time recruit coming out of high school and never quite maximized his potential because he couldn't stay healthy. But he showed flashes. Uh, he gave glimpses and tantalizing glimpses, and then those workouts were incredible. So um, I think if Josh Sweat had been healthy, he would have gone at least two rounds higher uh, and may, might have been a first-round pick. So that's one of those lottery tickets you get in the middle rounds, and if it hits, uh, it's incredible. Uh, but if, if he misses... And it could because there's a huge downside there. Uh, you're not out too much. And it's a good situation for him, too, because um, because he hasn't been on the field a lot. He needs some development. And the depth Philly has with pass rushers is just incredible. So they can kind of uh, bring him along slowly. Yeah, that was my follow. Is he a project? Does he need more polishing? Uh, how much of a complete uh, player is he? And do you see him helping out now? Because how he did say, we love our defensive linemen here, so, like, is this a stash kind of thing, stash and teach? Yeah, and, and it's not that he was wholly unproductive in college. I mean, he had almost 30 tackles for a loss and 15 sacks, so uh, it's not like it's all based on potential. He's shown flashes, and if he's healthy, there's certainly situations where you can get a guy with who's 6'5", 250, with 4'5", speed on the field. Uh, and uh, a guy who gives you some versatility, too. He moves so well uh, in space that he could play some outside linebacker in certain situations. You can drop him. So, yeah, if he's healthy, I think you want to get a talent like that on the field. Uh, Scott Wright, DraftCountdown.com. Matt Pryor, offensive tackle, uh, TCU. And the Eagles went with uh, Halapuli Vitae a couple of years ago, TCU, and they say this guy's even bigger than Big V. Yeah, he's uh, six six and three quarters, three hundred twenty eight pounds. Um, I had him in my guard rankings. Uh, could technically play either at the next level. Um, very limited when it t- comes to athleticism. Uh, he's, he, he ran a five six zero to put that in perspective. Uh, but he's at the NFL PA game and, and impressed there. So uh, absolutely, he was right there on that draft fringe. Went a little earlier than I thought he might, but you mentioned that rare size, and that's something you just can't teach or coach up. So. Uh, I guess I'm not surprised that a guy like that went a little earlier than I expected. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, just just rare size. At the very least, you know, you're going to get a versatile swing back up. Now, Scott, I know that you are excellent at what you do. And one of the things I love about having you on is I could throw a couple of uh, lower, uh, smaller school, lower rated guys, and you could rattle stuff off. <laughs> do you know anything about the guy from Australia? I do. He was in my rankings. Uh, I had him just the draftable range. But, uh, I mean, Six seven and seven eighths, three hundred and forty six pounds. He ran a five one two, and this is of course Jordan Mayavada from South Sydney, Australia. Uh, just a- unbelievable physical specimen. And before the draft, I was watching these YouTube clips of him playing rugby, and I mean it's unbelievable that he's the size he is because he moves like somebody who's who's six five three hundred pounds, except he's six eight three forty six. So very much a developmental project. I mean that's. That's a flyer in, 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 the, in every sense of the word, a lottery ticket, whatever you want to call it. But uh, at the same time, the potential there in the athleticism is absolutely incredible. And we'll see if he uh, is more of a, a practice squad type guy, how big of a project he is. But uh, late rounds, take a flyer on a talent like that. Uh, it's, it's like the old planet theory they talked about in, in George Young and the Giants. There's only so many guys on the planet with that type of blend of size athleticism. So uh, w- when you find one, why not take a flyer in the seventh round? So, Scott, it looks like the Eagles are going to use him on the offensive line. What position do you see him playing with his size and skill? Where do you think he best projects and could be useful? 
I mean, he's a tackle, I think. I think that's where you're going to look at him as an offensive tackle. And with that, with that type of size and athleticism, he's a left tackle, potentially. So, I mean, one of the most valuable commodities of sports, if you can coach him up and, and maximize that incredible potential he has. And I think that was a position where the Eagles needed to start thinking about the future and maybe bring in some other options. So um, it, he's as intriguing of an option as they possibly could have brought, brought in. And, and they probably don't even quite know what they have in him, I bet. You know, they'll, they'll probably get a – lot better idea once they get him on the field in their mini camps and training camp and that will probably determine the, the plan for him long term and the eagles moved up to get him by the way so they actually they must have had their and by the way i will scott has this gentleman in his pronunciation guide so he was anticipating being uh you know asked about this guy or something because there he is right there if you click on in draftcountdown.com the pronunciation guide he's got all these guys and there's jordan myalata right there so you can Learn how to pronounce it, Pete Thompson. But not my Alata. My Alata. There you go. Not my Lanta. But the Eagles traded up to get this guy, so they must have had their eyes on him. Yeah, and and you know what happens too sometimes in the late rounds is somebody in an organization they fall in love with the guy. It's a, a pet project. Uh, do do teams talk to a guy like this, or is it word? I mean, how did you hear about this guy? How do these teams find out about? I mean, I uh, from what Joe Douglas said, he was on YouTube. Yeah, and he was trained with the same guy who worked with Moritz Boringer from Germany a couple years ago, who was, I think, a fifth or sixth round pick in the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, so he was definitely on the radar. He was working for teams, and he was a guy that people were talking to. Um, like I said, I had him just outside the draft pool range, my offensive tackle rankings. But, uh, I mean, intrigued guy. And like I said, that's two late rounds. It's pet project time. There's such little difference between a sixth and seventh round pick and a priority free agent. Uh, and a lot of times it truly is just about getting that one team to fall in love with you or just one person in that organization and, and have a conviction. So uh, that could be very well what happened here. But uh, the Eagles have certainly done a very good job scouting in recent years. And, and you talk about Vitae they found in the late round, and he's turned out to be a steal for them. So uh, they know how to, how to bring in talent there and coach him up. So he landed in a good situation. Uh, Josh Adams, the running back, Notre Dame. Uh, Joe Osman from uh, Central Michigan. A lot of people uh, really like him as a potential sleeper. Jeremiah Briscoe, Jeremy Revis, uh, Toby Weathersby. Uh, these are some of the undrafted guys. Did any of the undrafted guys kind of stick out to you? Yeah, and the first two, uh, Josh Adams and who was the other guy that slips my mind? second guy you mentioned was Josh well Josh Adams he's the running back from Notre Dame I had a draftable grade on him and if it oh, weren't Joe Osman Joe Osman Joe Osman okay um Josh Adams if it weren't for the durability and health concerns I think he would have gone in but maybe the fourth round third round mm -hmm. uh but just he can't stay healthy and you saw him last year wear down as the season progressed and it gradually became less and less effective so but as a priority for agent I think he was one of the top guys out there so uh, the Eagles did a good job there. And and then Joe Osman, too. I thought he might get drafted late. Uh, and I had him in the draft ball range, just extraordinarily productive. Uh, 46 and a half tackles and lost, 28 sacks over his college career. Um, kind of a tweener, not the most athletic guy. Uh, he's undersized, doesn't have the ideal length you look for. So um, he's a DN outside linebacker, but it's hard to argue with the results on the field. And I think he's one of those guys who – who you look at the the, uh, the individual parts and it's not that impressive, but you add them all up and and, and it leads to a pretty good football player. So it's definitely two of the the top priority free agents that were out there and and actually have on the site my top sixty guys who went undrafted and and they're both pretty high on the list. Uh, another thing about DraftCountdown.com that I really like is because you see guys from our area that end up uh, getting drafted or signed. And you have the list of the small school rankings, PT. Uh, Jamil Denby from Vineland, uh, yeah, from uh, Maine, was uh, drafted. Uh, he was listed on uh, Scott's board. We also saw Abdullah um, Anderson. Anderson from Absagami. Yep. He got signed by the Bears. Uh, and uh, Ed Shockley, the linebacker from Millville, who went to Vineland, was also rated on your board. So, man, you do some deep research on some of these guys. Uh, but uh, that group there, and then Mike Gazicki, we talked about the other night. He ended up in uh, Miami with the Dolphins. So four local guys end up getting drafted. But, Scott, what was uh, some of the storylines of this draft that at the end of the day you look back at and, and you know that stood out to you? Oh, man, so many. Uh, one just that left to the top of my mind is that in the first round there was three or four picks where teams actually did take kind of take the best player available uh and you know we often hear they play lip service but what it really means is best player available at a position of need but i think you look at 
what the Broncos did with Bradley Chubb, what the, the Dolphins did with Minka Fitzpatrick and the Jaguars with Taven Bryan. Uh, they actually did go with that proverbial best player available. Uh, and then, I mean, the story of this draft, though, is going to be the quarterback. Right. Uh, and specifically the Cleveland Browns taking make Baker Mayfield at number one, the absolute riskiest thing they possibly could have done. Um, so, so those are a couple of things that jump out. And, um, and, and then these running backs, too. Uh, it, uh, this struck me during the draft is we saw kind of an early run on running backs. And I think what's happening in the NFL is the value of that position is coming back, at least the value in the draft, because – I think teams realize, hey, we can get good players who make a big impact at very low cost in the draft. The problem is when you have to sign them to that second contract. We'll, we'll see if that, that continues when it comes to giving running backs big contracts. I don't think that will, but at least in terms of the draft, I think teams have realized, well, we can get valuable players, and that's why uh, Sony Michelle sneaks into the back end of the round one, and that's why Rashad Penny sneaks into the back end of round one, and, and even why Carrion Johnson maybe goes around earlier than we thought he would. So, um, I, I think that's something to keep an eye on, not only with this draft, but moving forward. I think that's a, an area teams are, are looking to exploit. Uh, Ward and Chubb, will those two guys be connected for, you know, here, it was always Brandon Graham was kind of tied to Earl Thomas and JPP for a long time because the Eagles traded up to get Graham and Thomas was on the board. So it was always that kind of, you know, you were comparing their careers. Do you think Ward and Chubb will be that kind of, uh, you know, comparison? Yeah, to a certain degree, but but even that, I mean, it wasn't an egregious reach by any stretch of imagination. Uh, but but certainly, I, I think a lot of people expected the Browns to take Chubb, who most regard as the top defensive player in the draft. And and the Browns, they even came out and kind of admitted after the draft that that was based largely on need. They needed Denzel Ward. They needed that type of player. So um, and and you know we can go over that one, and, and you can. Uh, differ with that but ultimately it's just going to come down to that number one pick no matter what the Browns did the rest of the way it's it's coming down to Baker Mayfield and I'm very interested to see how soon he gets in there because remember he's 23 years old this isn't like they took Sam Darnold who was 20 a redshirt sophomore who you thought okay he might have to sit for a year Baker Mayfield's probably ready to go so it's going to be interesting to see how quickly he pushes Tyrod Taylor there how about the story of Shaquem Griffin? I mean, what a story oh, about him nice. with his brother. But the fact that he was drafted uh, in the uh, you know the fifth round there, did you think that he should have been a higher pick? Yeah, I think you could have made the argument. I had him as kind of a, a fringe late day two, early day three guy. So I would have been shocked if he had gone off the board with a compensatory pick uh, in the latter part of round three. But I kind of thought round four. And because he got invited to the draft, that kind of led me to believe that maybe somebody, they got word from somebody that they were going to take him in the second or the third round, mm-hmm. uh, which would have been a little rich for my blood. But I think he went right about where he should have gone because it, there's a good chance he's just going to be a backup and a special teamer at the next level. But that's still a valuable guy. And, uh, you know, I, I want him on my team. And, and rarely has there been a player I've personally rooted for more than Shaquem Griffin. I got to meet him down the senior bowl, just a, an infectious personality and, uh, just, just couldn't have worked out better for him to end up in Seattle with his brother, and uh, I, I hope he sells a lot of jerseys. And I know that fanboy fan base is going to support him, and um, just, just as good of a story as it gets. And in the NFL and just the world today, there's a lot of negative stories that bring you down, but you see something like that, it just brings a smile to your face. You know, and talking about stories, Scott, how about the story of Luke Falk from Washington State and the synergy yeah. between him and Tom Brady and where they were selected. Yeah, very much. I mean, Luke Falk is a, a Tom Brady obsessed, uh, and he wound up getting drafted. Wound up getting drafted in the exact same slot, number one ninety nine overall that Brady did. So, uh, just an incredible coincidence there. And, and and there was a number of things like that throughout throughout the draft. Uh, I remember watching the draft and. Uh, the, the, the Patriots took Braxton Berrios from Miami. It's like, exactly, of course they did. That's their perfect type of player. But maybe the best example is the Baltimore Ravens taking Orlando Brown, the offensive tackle from Oklahoma, who is the son of one of their legendary offensive linemen, Zeus Brown, even has the same nickname as his pops. And um, Lots of cool stories in this draft. Uh, it really was a good weekend. The draft is in the book, so uh, we'll see where it ends up next year. And, of course, uh, the uh, – Everybody's looking ahead to next year. Are you already working? Who are a couple of names to keep an eye on for the upcoming college football season? Oh, yeah, you better believe it. It's less than a year away. Uh, and, uh, of course, quarterbacks are always a story, so keep an eye on Drew Locke from Missouri there. But I think the story of next year's draft is going to be defensive linemen. Uh, Nick Bosa from Ohio State might be better than his brother Joey, who was a third overall pick. 
But then the defensive tackles, it could be a historic crop of defensive tackles uh, with Ed Oliver from Houston, who's actually already declared for the draft, believe it or not. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, Dexter Lawrence from Clemson. Uh, Rashawn Gary from Michigan. So uh, that, that's going to be the story next year at the top of the draft. Good year to be in the market for a defensive tackle. It, it could be like when Dominican Sue and Gerald – McCoy went uh, two and three overall. Mm, all right. Uh, Scott Wright, draftcountdown.com. If you're a draft nut, make sure you bookmark that page and get ready for 350 days away, the 2019 NFL Draft. Scott, uh, we appreciate all the uh, appearances, and uh, thanks you for your time, pal. We'll talk again at the draft next year. My pleasure. Anytime. Thanks for having me.